what a lovely welcome. Uh, yeah, I am Christine Levine. I am uh, living in Tucson now, but I am originally from Portland, Oregon. Hold your nope. Stop it. Now let me tell you about that shit show. Um, it was uh, I, I had to get out of Portland because Portland just got too weird. Um, and everybody was like, no, Portland's weird, but we like it that way. Uh, not me. It just reached a weirdness apex. Like, okay, fine, if you want to ride a unicycle, but when you ride a unicycle with bagpipes, I'm out. <laughs> when, when people were saying, like, uh, they, giving me dietary advice, saying, oh, I know why you're fat, Christine. You need to stop eating gluten. That's your problem. Oh, okay, so it's because I'm eating the sides of the cheeseburgers and not the middle? <laughs> it's just, right? I mean, it got stupid. So I gotta, I gotta get the hell out of here. It was not okay. So, um, and also, oh God, I don't wanna talk about this, but I also did something terrible that is embarrassing and will follow me for the rest of my life. I. I did this in Portland, and I did it because I got pressured into it. Um, I married a, a magician. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. I married him. I'm, I'm Christine Levine, and I married a magician. <laughs> there, I'll just say it, okay? Yeah, I did it. Yeah, I did it because all my friends were like, Christine, you need a man who can juggle. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be cool if you had a man who could throw cards into a watermelon? Wouldn't that be amazing? And I was like, yes. I just need more whimsy in my life. Because that's how Portland is. It's just full of whimsy. And it's cute and magical. And broke as shit. So, anyway, he made all my money disappear. And so... <laughs> We moved to Tucson, because <laughs> we're broke. <laughs> oh, anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm married to a goddamn a magician. Yeah, that's real. I'm just, I'm just getting started, you guys. Um, so, I, the, being married to him isn't all bad, except for the broke part. I mean, it's cute sometimes when he like hides my keys and puts them in the ether, whatever, <laughs> just throws them away. Um, but the worst part about it is that we are broke all the time. So when I lived in Portland, I, I mean, like, I went and I found a job. I actually had to go to work work, real work. And I found a job at, like, a factory. I mean, he smokes weed, and so he can't pass a drug test. I'm a drunk, and guess who can pass a drug test? Just me. So I found a real job, and I worked in this, like, factory place. And when I worked there, now, I have never really had a job before in my whole life. I've only worked three places. I have been, uh, I worked at a porn store for 14 years. <coughs> All right. And I was a mom for 20, 20 years, whatever, and a comedian. These are all jobs that you can drink at, <laughs> like, <laughs> while you're doing them. So, so, so I didn't understand, like, when I show up and they tell me I can't even take a Vicodin before work, are you shitting me? Anyway, but they were like, you know, no, and, you have to be real strict here, Christine. You've got to show up sober and, uh, yes, yeah, stay sober. Oh, okay, this is crazy. I was wearing blue jeans. Yeah, I don't understand it. I was wearing blue jeans to work and wearing steel-toed boots at this place. And, I mean, I would walk in and a Bob Seger song would play and smoke would rise behind me. I felt so badass. I was just like, oh, my God. I was punching a time clock, you guys. Have you ever seen one before? Uh, I mean, I love the sound of it, just kachunk, the romance of the working class. I was like, oh my God, I belong with you. Oh, what is this miracle? These guys would go on what's called a break, because when you're a mom, a porn clerk, and a comedian, your whole damn day's a break. <laughs> but, but these guys would like, they'd have a whistle, and then they'd go on, like on the Flintstones, and they'd go and they have a break, and then they'd all bitch about the boss. I don't even smoke, but I started buying cigarettes just so I could go out with those guys and be like, yeah, my boss is an asshole too. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys talk about? It's a miracle. 
And then, so I got really into like worker culture. I learned all about Cesar Chavez, no. Cesar Romero? Chavez, thank you, Chavez. I learned all about, I guess him. Anyway, not the point. I mean, I got into like working culture. I saw, I watched Norma Ray start to finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great movie. I started listening to Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, yeah, like B-sides, you guys. Like I got into it because because if anybody understands working culture, man, it's Bruce Springsteen. Like, he gets it. Look at the way he dresses, I thought. I thought he's got those holes in his jeans and T-shirts. Like, he knows workers. But, <laughs> yeah, I think someone here knows where I'm going with this. I found out. <laughs> okay, thanks to being, I was late to the party. I did not know. Found out, I read an article in Forbes magazine that Bruce Springsteen actually is worth $300 million. He actually has never worked a day in his life, ever, not one. He was rich and famous, his first record, boom, number one. He's rich and famous from day one. His parents bought him a, a, a guitar for his 16th birthday. He's literally never, ever even had a plan B. Like, oh, he, like all those songs about him working at the mill, he's never worked at a goddamn mill in his life. <laughs> he has... He has a song about leaving New Jersey and he still lives in New Jersey. <laughs> what? I was outraged. I was like, how does he, how does he even, where does he get his materials? He, he just ha has a Nebraska Times obituaries delivered to his house. <laughs> and he's just reading or, oh, I write a song about these old assholes. <laughs> Oh, oh no, he's got a cousin that he calls Larry Springsteen. He calls up dumb Larry, who works at the mill, and he's like, oh, hey, Larry, I'm just uh, checking on you, you know. I just want to see how you're doing. And, uh, you know, and then Larry's so stupid, he doesn't know what's going on. Larry's just a working guy going, oh, hey, Bruce, think his rich cousin's calling him to check on him for real. Oh, thanks, Bruce, thanks for calling me. You know, you always call when my life is in the hellhole. Why, why is that? Oh, I was just a, I was just a coincidence, I'm sure. I just, just calling. I heard that you, I heard that you got laid off at the mill. That's terrible. Uh, oh yeah, I did. Hey, listen, Larry. Uh, did you maybe get like a pink slip or something when you got laid off at the mill? Larry's so dumb. Yeah, you know what? I did get a pink slip. How did you know? Oh, good. Pink rhymes with stuff. Yeah. Uh, that is amazing. Oh, hey, Larry, I heard that you had to put your dog down. That probably hurt a lot. I mean, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't clone my dog. No, he can't say that. He clones his dog because he's rich, and he can. <laughs> and, and Larry sometimes, like, and then Bruce goes, hey, Larry, oh, finally, before I let you go, hey, tell me what, it, what does a tear feel like? Can you just... Talk slow, so I don't, I don't want to miss it. Stupid. I called up my friend Patty in LA. She is the one who turned me on to this monster. She is the one who made me start listening to Bruce Springsteen. She was like, "Oh, you got a real job now. You want to listen to Bruce Springsteen?" And like she like uh, like first taste is free. You know what I mean? And then and then I so I devoured him. And then it, so I blame her and I called her up and I said, "What? You didn't tell me that he's actually super rich and he doesn't." Like, where does all this come from? Like, I really did marry a magician. That's a true thing from me. You're getting the best at Christine. I'm telling you the truth. It's embarrassing, but I'm saying it. Bruce Springsteen, you guys don't know any, we do not know shit about this guy. He's just, just talking. So I call Patty and she says to me, no, Christine, you've got to go see him. You've got to see him to understand it. It's a three-hour show, and it's $100 a ticket, but it's a three-hour show. I said, oh, my God, you mean to tell me that there's, like, a supervisor backstage that's like, Springsteen, get out there. These people aren't going to make themselves sad. This sing-song factory is working overtime tonight. Get on. Oh, sure. Okay, great. Oh, and then I've got to work 10 hours, $100 a ticket. I've got to work 10 hours at the shit pit so that I can go listen to Bruce Springsteen sing songs to me about me. No! No! No. A little cleansing. 
listen, I'm going to tell you guys this. There are people out there who want to have sex with fat girls that are, they're called chubby chasers. Like, I am a person of size, yes, and I know these guys. Like, I've got them online. They find me online and they're like, you're so beautiful. I love your round belly. Can I please, like, how many cheeseburgers can you eat at a set? Can, can you eat ten? Can you eat three? Five cheeseburgers. Okay, that's my final offer. Uh, would you please sit? Would you? This is no, totally true. Would you please sit on a cake for me? Please, and then we'll eat the cake, and then I'm like, that's not a first date. What are you doing? This is like before I got married, but it's still, they're just so disgusting. <sighs> what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, is that Bruce Springsteen is the chubby chaser of the American workforce. You got it? <laughs> with a vat of ranch dressing and motor oil, right, and just jerks off to Mike Rowe and Dirty Jobs, just, uh, you're so filthy, yeah, you're working. <laughs> All right, that's it.